from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Coming up in the next hour, out with the old and in with the meta. Mark Zuckerberg goes all in on the metaverse, doubling down on immersive reality and rebranding the entire platform, even changing Facebook's stock ticker. We'll talk about all of it with Meta's Global Business Group Vice President, Nicola Mendelson, this hour. Plus, Apple and Amazon plummeting in late trading. Amazon projecting holiday sales that fell short of estimates indicating a pandemic boom for e-commerce could be over. Meantime, Apple, iPhones, and Macs falling short of estimates. Along with fourth quarter revenue, we will break down all the results. And big tech bands together to build a more diverse workforce. We'll talk exclusively with the chief diversity officers of Snap, Uber, and Spotify to talk about a new plan to make workplaces more inclusive across Silicon Valley and the global tech industry. But first, the social network that we've all known as Facebook for the last 16 years now has a new name, and it is Meta. CEO Mark Zuckerberg announced the name change during the company's Connect conference. Take a listen. This is the most definitive signal yet of its ambitions to focus on virtual reality and the metaverse over the next 16 years. Will the new name distance the social network from the onslaught of criticism that it prioritizes profit over people? Our Ed Ledlow has been outside headquarters of the company now known as Meta in Menlo Park, California. And Ed, you saw that sign change happen, that big change right there over your shoulder. Yeah, nine seconds after Zuckerberg stopped speaking, they just whipped off the canvas and there was the new sign. So clearly they've been thinking about it for a while. A change of name, the same corporate structure, no change to the Facebook properties, including Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp and Instagram. That all remains. But it's the biggest signal yet that Facebook or now Meta is staking its future on the metaverse. And actually one of the bigger changes is that the stock ticker will change from FB to MVRS on December 1st all things being equal. This is not just about gaming. They, they revealed this new Oculus headset and a range of use cases, which were fitness and health, a big surprise for virtual health fitness classes. Gaming, of course, a new Grand Theft Auto for virtual reality, but also business. Mark Zuckerberg said this would be big for the economy, but also big for the environment. Imagine a situation where instead of flying across the country for a meeting, you both wear your Oculus headset and you're one on one in a virtual space. So that is the vision that Mark Zuckerberg outlined. But he was candid. This will take a decade at least before it has mass reach. Emily. All right, Ed Ludlow, thank you so much. A little later, we're going to be speaking with Nicola Mendelson, vice president of Meta's Global Business Group right here on Bloomberg Technology. I want to take a look now at how investors reacted to this news. Our Kriti Gupta joins us with the details. Kriti, how did the markets take it? Well, Emily, Facebook shares positive on the day. But let's take a little bit of a step back here and put this into perspective because it's been about two months of really share pressure, two months where Facebook has been trying to deal with those, of course, Apple advertising. We're talking about growth concerns and, of course, that whistleblower testimony. What I really want to point out, though, is what this new move to the metaverse essentially is going to do to its bottom line. $27 billion. That's how much they're expected to jump in cost in 2022. And just for some perspective, that's actually one quarter of Facebook's annual revenue. So going to potentially hit their bottom line for this longer term investment like Ed Ludlow talked about. I want to hit those earnings stories though because Facebook isn't the only mover on the day. We have Apple earnings and Amazon earnings. Let's kick it off with Amazon down 4.3% after hours putting a poor holiday sales forecast attributing some of that to uh, supply chain concerns but also the fact that they're going to have to hire even more delivery workers and that's going to cut into their profit. So missing estimates on that front and really taking it on the chin there down 4.3 percent after hours it was down almost six percent after hours looks like it's paired some of those losses let's get to apple though because that seems to be the big story dragging down its entire supply chain looks like skyworks and broadcom have paired those initial gains but they were down on when the headlines first came out and this coming after apple also missing on their total revenue their iphone revenue and their mac revenue what did well though emily it was their ipad revenue so the question here is do you start to see them come back up going into the holiday season and what it does it this look like regionally, China seemed to be the outperformer, but the rest of the world, not so much. 
All right, Critty, thanks for that. I want to stick with Apple results and bring in Julie Oska, Forrester Research. Julie, what's your takeaway? You know, obviously all companies, all retailers dealing with a lot now, supply chain issues, but um, with, you know, Mac and, and iPhone sales missing, that's kind of a big deal, right? So I don't think it's a bit, I don't, so I, I think certainly missing is like missing their expectations, missing investor expectations, but Apple still grew at double digit growth. Um, they continue to deliver double digit growth year in and year out. I don't think anyone's stressed about Apple. Um, I think if we look at, you know, most of Apple's sales still come from hardware. Uh, while yes, most of consumers, not over 90% of consumers may own a smartphone or a computer, only half own a tablet, maybe a third own a smart speaker or a smart watch. There's still a lot of upside for Apple on the, um, the hardware side. Uh, certainly Apple's target audience tends to be affluent. They're gonna be less price sensitive. They still have a lot of confidence and we're about to go into the holiday season, which is one of the biggest seasons of the year. Uh, Apple's doing really well to uh, bring consumers and sell into their ecosystem, sell services. Uh, their marketing is very sophisticated. Um, and I think certainly, you know, if we look at, you know, according to Forrester, 44% of consumers are very concerned about the values of those brands from whom they buy. And I think Apple scores really well there as well. So I don't, I don't think anyone's worried about Apple, even if they missed, you know, expectations of this quarter. Tim Cook on the call right now saying demand was very robust despite supply constraints. Does that mean you're not concerned about supply constraints? I mean, we've, we've reported that Apple could cut production of the new iPhone by as many as 10 million units. Yeah, so I think there's certainly some risks, like the semiconductors are a risk, supply chain is a risk. As you talked about, uh, the cost of labor, whether it's in stores or for delivery, is certainly a risk. Uh, but, but I think we're also talking, I mean, getting away from the financial sector, we're talking about a company here that they may be missing expectations. They may not sell as much as quickly, but it's still a very strong company that continues to perform amazingly well, you know, throughout the pandemic, you know, with or without a pandemic. We're still at home working, we're still at home with education, we're still at home streaming media, and Apple's selling goods and services in all the places that consumers are buying today. Meantime, sales in China almost doubled to $15 billion. What do you make of that? So, well, I would tell you, while I'm not an expert on the Chinese market, I do think that Apple does a better job, you know, as one company selling devices, selling services, whether it's payment or it's music, it's media, it's entertainment, they do a better job of bringing consumers into that ecosystem, keeping them there. And, you know, the, what we call the lifetime value of a customer is very high for them. And that's something that I think the Android ecosystem doesn't compete very well with. So I think that would be one of the reasons. All right, Julie Oscar, Forrester Research, thank you so much for joining us and weighing in. Uh, meantime, a story we're continuing to watch, and that is Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick has asked the company's board to cut his compensation until the video game maker meets its gender equity goals. Kotick made more than $154 million last year, most of it in stock awards. His new compensation would be a little more than $62,000. Last week, Activision failed to convince a California court to temporarily halt a sexual harassment and discrimination case against the company. Coming up. If we all work at it, then within the next decade, the metaverse will reach a billion people, host hundreds of billions of dollars of digital commerce, and support jobs for millions of creators and developers. Mark Zuckerberg is all in on the metaverse. At its Connect conference, Facebook unveiled Horizon Home, in addition to the Oculus Quest 2 virtual reality headset. But its biggest news is, of course, a total rebranding. Zuckerberg unveiled the company's new brand name, brand new name, I should say, Meta. We talked to Meta Global Business Group Vice President Nicola Mendelssohn about the company's game plan. Next, this is Bloomberg. It is time for us to adopt a new company brand to encompass everything that we do. To reflect who we are and what we hope to build, I am proud to announce that starting today, our company is now Meta. There we have it. After weeks of speculation, Mark Zuckerberg has made it official, rebranding Facebook to Meta decoupling its corporate identity from the social network mired in controversy over its toxic content and highlighting a shift to an emerging computing platform focused on virtual reality. Zuckerberg called the metaverse the next frontier. And on December 1st, the Facebook stock ticker will be changed to MVRS, literally. 
To better understand this big shift, we are joined by Nicola Mendelson, Vice President of Meta's Global Business Group. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us. Just a few hours ago, you, you worked at a company. Me. Just a few hours ago, you worked at a company called Facebook. Now it is Meta. You are even changing the stock ticker, and even Google didn't do that. Given that the vast majority of the company today doesn't work on the metaverse at all, why take this risk? Well, first, uh, we don't see it as a risk, and we're just coming off a company all hands, and the excitement at the company is very real. And Meta really captures where our company's going and also the future that we want to build. But our mission hasn't changed. Meta's focus is all around building the metaverse, but continuing to let people connect, to find communities, to grow businesses in the way that they have uh, with the Facebook family of apps over the almost 20 years that we've been going. And it really reflects and also solves the confusion that I think there has been out there caused by our company name sharing the same name as our, as our biggest app. And as I said, you know, Facebook started as a single app and now we're a whole family of apps and services with Instagram and WhatsApp and so many others. And Meta actually brings together all of these apps, all of these technologies under one new, brand new company brand. Give us some color on what the Horizon Marketplace looks like. Is it going to work like an app store? Will there be a subscription model? How will people make money in this new world? Oh, lots of questions there. So first up with Horizon, well, that's the social platform that we're going to be building for people to create and interact in the metaverse. So with Horizon Worlds, well, that's where you can build worlds and you can jump into them with your friends, with your family, with your colleagues, and to discover new places that you might want to go and meet together in or, or play games in or get to know different members of your community with different avatars that you might have. And Horizon Home is really our early vision for the home space in the metaverse. And Horizon Workrooms, which is you know, already up and running, is there for collaboration. And you know, I was just in a meeting last week and that feeling that you, when you're sat around a virtual table, and especially in this world today where we're all working in a much more hybrid way, it's very different just from having a one-on-one -on -one straight into the screen like you and I are doing now. You actually feel like you're sat around the table. You do turn left, you do turn right, depending on where the audio is coming from. So it's a very different okay. experience. It's an enhanced, if you like, social experience. But what if the metaverse and AR and VR don't make the world more social at all, make us more disconnected, more antisocial, and replicates so many of the criticisms that face Facebook today? Well, that's not the case from the experiences that I've already been enjoying and already having uh, in, you know, when I've been into VR, when I'm playing games, or actually when I'm, I'm meeting and hanging out with people. So I've been to the moon. That's not probably the first person that you've had on here saying I've been to the moon with my colleagues and we took with our avatars virtual selfies against the, um, you know, get backdrops of the sun and backdrops of, of Earth. But I think also... At the heart of your question also is a, a well is, is making sure that we're addressing and building responsibly for the metaverse. And I think there's a couple of things here that are really important to point out. One is that no one company alone is going to be building the metaverse. Many different companies, many different developers, businesses are going to be building together. But what I do think that is important is that we're building in the principles of safety and security right in from the start. And that if we have these principles right as a society, then we're going to be so much better at tackling the new challenges that inevitably come along with new technologies as and when they arise. The Facebook files, Nicola, have revealed some of the ills of social media that Facebook knew internally. But from the public's perspective, it appears you did not act on, that Instagram was toxic to teens, that less than 5% of hateful content was taken down. Is Facebook taking a longer look in the mirror right now or running away? Or are you committing to double down and take some accountability for these issues? You know, what we're seeing right now is a coordinated effort to selectively use leaked documents to paint a false picture of our company. And it really doesn't in any way reflect the company that I know and that I'm passionate about and that I love working about. And I'm actually really proud of our record navigating these complicated trade-offs involved in operating in a services of scale. And I would say, look at the actions that we've taken, look at the considerable investments that we've made. Uh, if I just take this year, we're on track to spend more than $5 billion 
on safety and security. And I think that's more than any other tech company, even if you adjust for scale. And the fact that we now have 40,000 people that are working on safety, that are working on security uh, for the company, I think shows that we're not running away, that we absolutely understand the responsibilities that we have. And against the different areas that you could look at, you can see that the progress that we're making across all these different areas. But you're 40,000 people serving 3 billion users. So there's this question, is Facebook just too big to govern? There may be so many smart and well-intentioned and capable people who work there, but can you moderate every political, moral, and religious issue in every single country and every language around the world? Or is that just impossible for any one company to do? So one of the things that we've set out to do is actually set out and be very open and transparent about the work that we're doing in this area. And so that's why we now publish four times a year the Community Standards Enforcement Report. And we're even opening our books up um, to EY as an independent auditor to be able to validate and look at our results. Now, I think this is some of the most comprehensive, most sophisticated work that is going on uh, anywhere around the world. And I'm really proud of that work. And, you know, but, but to your question, we're not satisfied if there's anything on our platform that could in any way, you know, cause harm to somebody. And so we're committed to continuing to get it down off, off our platform. We might not be able to get everything down, but we absolutely are committed to do everything we can to make those numbers as, as small as possible. Meantime, Facebook's core ad business remains the engine of growth for now. We've seen Facebook and Twitter and Snap take a hit as a result of the Apple ad tracking technology changes. Apple's reporting its earnings results today. They actually uh, missed estimates for fourth quarter revenue. But I'm curious if you have any words for Apple right now as somebody who is so influential in Facebook, or I should say Meta's ad business. No, we've um, we've been warning for a long time about um, Apple's iOS 14 policy and the fact that really it's been benefiting their own bottom line at the expense of small businesses and at the expense of creators. And I think we're seeing that play out now, especially with small businesses where, you know, they have really small budgets. And for these small budgets to work, they've got to be able to reach the customers that matter to them. And especially over the last year, we've seen how vital it was for you know, small businesses to be able to, you know, if they weren't able to open their shops, to be able to reach out and find the customers that matter uh, to them. And at its heart, we do believe that privacy and advertising can coexist, but without the collateral damage caused by Apple. There have been questions about Mark Zuckerberg's continuing role at the company, and I'm curious if there's any indication he might step back as CEO, move into uh, you know, a solely chairman role like we saw Larry and Sergey do at Google. And similarly for Cheryl, will, will she um, um, take on a different role or take a step back if the ad business is less important than the metaverse? Nobody is saying that the um, ad business is less important at, at Facebook. It, it is an important part of, of how we of how we do business. And I wish you could have seen the the uh, the all hands that we just came off that mo both Mark and Cheryl were on, and the excitement that that was emanating from not just Mark and Cheryl but all of our leaders at the company, sharing the vision, exploring it, having fun with uh, with all of our employees, and uh, really toasting towards this next vision. For the company over the over the decades ahead. So, as you know, somebody who is so criti critical in running the global ad business, I'm curious: what is the ad opportunity that you see in the metaverse? How effective do you think ad targeting will be there? And tell us a little bit more about your own experience and what you think advertisers will get out of this. So, I think there's going to be uh, a lot of exciting opportunity for for advertisers, but. I think first and foremost, there'll be a lot that just happens in the metaverse for free as there is in the internet today. Um, but there will be advertising opportunities. But the way that we build all of our products, first and foremost, is that we start with people. We start with people and we make sure that, you know, and understand how people are using and enjoying our products and then, and then we go from there. I think there's gonna be opportunities for creators and we're gonna make sure that we're building the tools that both creators and developers need um, in order to help them be successful in the metaverse uh, as well. So I think there's a lot to be excited about. I'm already seeing businesses, you know, starting to explore what it's like to actually experiment with uh, augmented reality. So I think about the fact that you can go on Instagram today and you can try on virtually a pair of Ray-Ban glasses in the Ray-Ban shop or Charlotte Tilbury, right. where you can try makeup on and, and lipstick. So we're already seeing brands start to uh, 
start to have fun with it. Now, Nicola, you're having lots of conversations with advertisers every day, and I have to ask you, are they concerned about the social media onslaught? Are they concerned about the, 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 the claims and, and revelations of the whistleblower Francis Haugen? Because the, the critics wonder how any advertiser right now can justify advertising on Facebook's platforms. Yeah, so I'm having what I would say is very thoughtful and considered conversations with advertisers. And what they're acknowledging and what they're seeing is the thoughtfulness of the approach, the investments that we're making, and the considerable progress that we have been making um, over the years. They recognize um, how, the, uh, how the, uh, the conversation has been taken out of context. They recognize why it's right for a company to do research about its own products to understand um, how to constantly improve them. And they understand that, and they think that's an important part. And they also see our commitment to the work that we do with organizations like GARM uh, and on the MRC as well. And that's work that we stand by and is really important to us. All right, Nicola Mendelson from Meta. I almost said Facebook. Nicola, joining <laughs> us on a late evening in London. Thank you very much for joining us and, and sharing the new vision. We'll be back with more of Bloomberg Technology after this quick break. A few other stories we're watching. Mark Cuban's basketball team, the Dallas Mavericks, is having a giveaway for fans. But it is not your typical bobblehead or t-shirt freebie. The Mavericks have announced a five-year partnership with Voyager Digital and fans that sign up with the cryptocurrency trading platform in the first 48 hours will get $100 in free Bitcoin. And Microsoft is getting back into the personal computer game business. The maker of the Xbox video game console has come out with Age of Empires 4, the first installment of the series in 16 years. The Microsoft executive in charge said if you want to speak to gamers, you have to go beyond the console and speak to PC gamers as well. Coming up, Shopify's six-year earnings streak comes to an end. After the break, I'll speak with the company's president about what he needs to get that back. And Apple CEO Tim Cook is speaking on the earnings call now. Take a listen to what he had to say about Apple TV+. Plus. In just its first two years, Apple TV+, Plus has already proved itself to fans around the world. And I want to congratulate the incredible actors, writers, storytellers, producers, and everyone else whose behind the scenes work has made that success possible. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. I want to get back to tech earnings. Our Kriti Gupta has been following all of the reports coming out. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, after hours, let's just kick it off with Facebook. They didn't report earnings, but they did have that major change in name now called Meta. Uh, you are seeing, of course, shares up 1.5% intraday. After hours, about flat, but it's really Amazon and Apple that's taking the cake because they both missed their earnings estimates. App, Amazon, I should say, actually putting a lower-than-expected holiday forecast, saying the supply chain costs and those labor shortages are going to affect their holiday numbers. And they also have Apple, of course, missing on total revenue, iPhone revenue, and Mac revenue, only their iPad revenue was up. So, of course, both those stocks under pressure. I want to hit uh, from big tech in the U.S. to big tech in Canada because Shopify also reported their earnings today and they actually missed their estimates, but the stock ended up higher by 7% on the day and it was all because analysts said, well, yeah, they missed their earnings, but they also have this major long-term potential and you can kind of see that year to date. That has really been the sentiment because, Emily, not only is Shopify higher on the day, it's higher on the year uh, by this year, higher on 2021, outperforming the Canadian benchmark, which it is the largest member of, but also outperforming Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and even the S&P 500, Emily. All right, Kriti, thanks for that. I want to stick with Shopify and its rare earnings miss. Ta joining me now, president of Shopify, Harley Finkelstein. Okay, Harley, it had to happen at some point, but why did it happen now? Well, look, I, I think just let's just level set here for a second. I think we are sort of in this new normal post pandemic, but I, I don't think there's anything average about what Shopify and our merchants are building. I think that 2020 will forever have an asterisk by it in the history books. But as things begin to settle into sort of this new post pandemic trend, our merchants and Shopify are growing at an extraordinary speed. 
Emily, it took us 15 years for the merch, our merchants to get to $200 billion of GMV, Camilo GMV, and just 16 months to double that. GMV was up 35% uh, for the quarter, 41 billion. When you look at revenue, we, we hit 1.1 billion in revenue up 46%. So what we are seeing is more merchants uh, are coming to Shopify. They're launching more merchants, getting larger on Shopify, and they're taking more of our services. And I think what is becoming clear in this new world is that we are really building the essential internet infrastructure for commerce, and we expect Q4 to grow substantially faster than the retail sector overall. Okay. How is the supply chain issue challenges that seem to be snarling <laughs> everyone? How, how is that affecting Shopify and all of the businesses that rely on you? Yeah. So we did not see a material impact from the supply chain. Uh, we saw that inventory levels and delivery times did not change materially from Q3 last year to this year. What I would also say is on the supply chain, it seems like every single year, the small businesses and the merchants that use Shopify, they seem to always face these new challenges, whether they're uh, you know, uh, things like the pandemic or uh, supply chain in this case. And what we notice is that our merchants are really, really good at being resilient. We also have a very diversified merchant base across verticals, geographies, channels, and many of those source, uh, source locally and have room in their margins uh, to absorb some of these shocks. You have to sort of remember that most of the merchants on Shopify, they use the direct to consumer model, which we think is going to be the mainstay in retail. They're not like these big box retailers operating on razor thin margins. And so when you combine the fact that a lot of them do have a direct relationship with the end consumer, they, a lot of them make their own products, uh, we have not seen a major slowdown. Now that being said, if supply chain does become a long-term issue, I think merchants will need Shopify more than ever before to find efficiency to go direct. I had mentioned on the call uh, earlier today that you know we saw brands like L'Occitane and Muji and Spanx and Dockers and Tupperware and, and FTD, a 100-year-old flower company, all sent up for okay. Shopify this past quarter. We're seeing them go direct more in a way they haven't, they haven't done in the past. Shopify is a huge partner of Facebook, now Meta. What do you think? What do you think of the new name, the metaverse future, and how in influential will Meta be in the future of commerce? Look, Facebook has been an amazing partner to us. Uh, I actually kind of like the new name. I think I know there's uh, some people are, are unsure about it. I, I think it's a great name. I think it, it better articulates what they're, at least what I saw today uh, in their developer conference, what they're, what they're planning. The key for us though, is that we, do, we believe that the future of retail is going to be retail everywhere. We think it's going to be online, offline. We, we announced a partnership a week ago with Spotify. Now we're embedding commerce right into Spotify. So artists who are also entrepreneurs can sell more easily. We have a partnership with TikTok. But when you know Facebook launched Messenger, we we're the launch partner for commerce. We're the launch partner for Instagram commerce and on Facebook. We're now putting Shopify pay into Facebook for both Shopify merchants and non-Shopify merchants. So if the metaverse is a place where shopping happens and commerce happens, we're really fortunate that Facebook has, has been incredibly, you know, has been a great partner for us over the years. And we suspect we will be the launch partner for commerce inside of Facebook. Or better, Harley Finkelstein, president of Shopify. Thank you Thanks. for joining us. All right, I want to move to Amazon now. Lower in after hours trading after giving a forecast for holiday sales that fell short of estimates. New CEO Andy Jassy warning that supply chain issues could cost the company several billions during the busy holiday shopping season. I'm joined now by Melissa Burdick, co-founder and president of PackView, an e-commerce platform that helps companies like Amazon with ad sales and Intel. And of course, she used to work at Amazon for many years. Um, what do you? What's your take on this, this holiday uh, quarter? And is the pandemic e-commerce boom over? Is the e-commerce boom over? It's the crazy growth of it might be over, but that was pretty unsustainable. And, it, you know, it's true that there was some disappointing gu guidance. Uh, there's so many headwinds this quarter. There's labor supply shortages from warehouse workers to tech workers. The need to pay higher wages, glo this global supply chain issue. Um, some other things that happened this quarter, too, was there was no big tentpole event. So they pulled Prime Day from uh, Q3 to Q2 in June. Um, and then the other thing in talking to some brands was there was a higher return to, to store shopping this quarter as well. So more vaccines and people actually wanted to go shop in stores. Go figure. So is there any, the net is, there is anything, what's that? Is there anything that Amazon can do to deal with the supply chain issues, you know, especially during the shopping season? And, and how do you expect them to weather, you know, Obviously, you know, we've seen Amazon weather many challenges, but but this one in particular seems like a hard one. 
what Amazon does so well is their third party marketplace. And so they use the third party merchants to be able to fill in selection. And that's where, you know, some merchants may have issues with supply chain, but not everybody does. They have the biggest marketplace. And so these sellers can fill in selection gaps and that's one of their secrets to success. And then if you need something, you can always buy an Amazon gift card if you can't find what you're looking for. Okay, well, that was my next question is, should we as customers temper our expectations for what we can get this holiday season? Should we start buying now um, for our friends and family? That's what everyone's been saying. Amazon started Black Friday deals on October 4th. So I think what we're gonna see is just kind of constant deals throughout the quarter, um, people buying holiday gifts. And that's really what the industry has been saying is if you wait till the last minute, like many people do every year, you may not be able to find that, especially in consumer electronics and toys. All right, Melissa Burdick, PacView co-founder and president. Thank you for joining us. Coming up, calling for more diversity in tech. We're gonna be joined by diversity, equity, and inclusion experts from Snap, Uber, and Spotify to talk about their latest efforts to lay out a roadmap of how we create a more inclusive tech industry. That is next, this is Bloomberg. Well, look, the number one word is ambition. Um, uh, we're not where we need to be. Um, about 120 countries have put in new commitments to 2030. About 70 of those are improvements, but we are not going to get under current plans to where we need to get to, which is a halving of greenhouse gases by 2030. So um, it's great that more than 100 heads of state are coming. They need to raise their game. Some have already raised it, others need to do so. Bezos Earthfront President and CEO Andrew Steer there with a dire warning ahead of the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. You can catch more of that interview on this edition of Bloomberg Technology tomorrow. More diversity in tech is needed sorely, as we all know, and collective action needs to happen now. This is according to the new report Action to Catalyze Tech, or ACT, brought by 29 leading diversity, equity, and inclusion experts from academia and the tech industry. They call on tech companies to commit to action to solve systemic inequality in technology, which they say is an industry-wide challenge that must be tackled by working together. For more on that, I want to turn to our panel. I am joined now by Una King, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at SNAP, Bo Young Lee, Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Uber, and Travis Robinson, Global Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging at Spotify. Thank you all so much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Um, I want to start with you, Una. You are all part of a group of companies that's now banding together to improve diversity in the workplace. How exactly will you at various different companies be working together, Una? Well, essentially what the ACT report does is uh, sign us up to taking collective action because, you know, we win or lose at DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion together in product quite often or with the tech products we create, we win or lose on our own. That's not the same uh, with DEI. And, you know, two things really strike me. Um, I've spent two decades in DEI, five years in tech. And these are the two things. First, the tech industry has failed on DEI. And second, I've seen with my own eyes, there are passionate, committed, clever people in the tech industry that really want change. So the ACT report is for them. It lays out a roadmap for that change. It, it shows us how we can come together and also adds a bit of inspiration. So if people want to know the answer to the question that the expert group spent one year answering how to transform DEI in the tech industry, but it's applicable to all industries, then I hope they'll check out the report. Meantime, you're all competitors, and the war for talent is brutal. Poaching from a limited talent pool is a huge problem. And I wonder, Travis, why align yourselves rather than trying to get all that diverse talent on your own? Sure. And I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us. As a system, we can impact change. The more we come together, the more opportunity we can to attract and, and recruit individuals into um, these amazing opportunities. So here at Spotify, we just announced our Work From Anywhere program, where we're democratizing the access to opportunity beyond the, the major cities of New York, Los Angeles, or London. You can work from anywhere 
And we believe that this is one angle and one opportunity that we believe that talent that are all across the globe can get into tech. So we're trying to identify ways across with our partners, Una and Bo. We believe together we can come together to increase the not only the attraction to the tech industry, but also democratize and, and, and develop ways for us to increase access into different opportunities. So the mindset of this distributed first workplace, that is the way of the future. And for us to think about different ways of working, the only way that's going to be possible is we, if we come together as an industry to be able to solve this problem. And I believe that's what the ACT report um, helps us do. Bo, tell us more about what your companies will commit to doing specifically to boost the talent pool and open up access. Absolutely. So um, I think at the core of this, and it's spelled out in the four recommendations in the ACT report, really, is it's about both modeling and incentivizing that um, inclusive talent and the leadership. And we are all going to share what we're doing to incentivize our leaders. How are we modeling it? We're going to operationalize it. And I think at Uber, we've, we've demonstrated that we have been able, if you look at our pay equity, uh, which we published in our annual People and Culture report, Uber has been able to achieve pay equity for the past three years without making any major uh, substantive uh, changes. And that's because we, we made changes in our um, in our hiring process, in our development process, as well as our promotion process. And then uh, sharing DNI data, again, it's so important for us to be able to be really transparent about where we've made progress, but also where we failed. Right. It's only in that transparency that we'll all learn together. And then finally, it is really about, you know, and Travis really talked about this, it's expanding the pool because right now we are all trying to get our unfair share of a very limited pool because there still is a lot of uh, stereotypes that uh, prevent us from seeing talent in, in other avenues. And so it's about investing, growing that pool of talent. And that's the only way we're going to uh, address the underlying uh, challenges within the tech industry. I wonder what discussions you've had with your CEOs about this report and about these issues. For example, Una, have you talked to Evan Spiegel? You know, is he committed to making DEI a chief company business imperative? And what do you expect from him? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole initiative actually came about as a result of um, a comment he made to me um, because I was saying, hey, look, here's our DEI plan. And, you know, I, I've written many of those <laughs> plans and strategies we all have. And it's about, you know, how do you get more inclusive uh, workforce product culture? But I said to him, look, the thing is, no one leader, no one company can solve this, right? So if we really wanted to do it right, this needs to be a cross industry approach. And he was like, well, then that should be the strategic priority. So it actually started from that conversation. We come to this at SNAP from a position of complete humility. I mean, you know, our point is we don't have all the answers, but if we are to ask the questions together, that's the way we're most likely to find success and accelerate what has been agonizingly incremental progress. Because to the earlier points, we have to address some of the root problems. At the moment, all we do is play like diversity musical chairs. That's kind of like the best way you can say it. The worst is we're just poaching each other's like diverse talent. I hate that phrase, but you know what I mean? And at the end of the day, we have to expand the actual pool of that talent itself by addressing educational inequities and other systemic barriers. Well, and as you say, there's a huge disconnect between what executive thinks, executives think about their workplace and what workers think about their workplace. For example, research found that 75% of execs believe that women and ethnic minorities feel a sense of belonging in their organizations. That belief is actually only shared by 24% of women and uh, underrepresented minority employees. Travis, how do you start addressing this? Yep, that's a great question. And, and the research shows, and even in this, in this current state, you have to think about connectivity and community building when it comes to this sense of belonging. Um, it has to be intentional, and you have to shift mindsets and behaviors. And as Una mentioned, the, this is paramount to what this, this coalition of individuals are coming together to address. The old way of doing things is no longer the, the way of the future. So we have to come together to think strategically about how do we establish community in a distributed first workplace, but also be intentional in, in realizing the data shows that individuals from historically excluded communities are having a different experience. But it all first starts with the data, and, and that will help us think about strategies
strategies and solutions. But once again, if we come together, it can accelerate the diversity. It can infuse the inclusion and be able to amplify belonging in a meaningful way. And the only way to do that is actually be intentional with the steps that, are, that it takes. You know, one of the big uh, advancements in the last decade is companies reporting their diversity statistics. Right. But sadly, when you look at those statistics, the numbers don't move that much every year. Sometimes they even backtrack. Bo, what's it going to take to see real change? Is it going to be years? Is it going to be decades? Well, I hope it's not decades. I hope it is It is years. And, you know, Uber is a really great example of a company that actually has been able to make progress. Since 2019, we've seen an over 10% increase in a women in leadership. We've almost doubled the representation of underrepresented people of color in our leadership as well in the last two years. And But what it will take is not just simply putting uh, simple bandages and putting in programs, so to speak. It's about fundamentally um, redesigning the culture that exists within tech. You know, Emily, you wrote a book a few years ago, Brotopia, talking about like the fact that the tech industry culture is really defined by this very like hyper masculine uh, culture. And, and that is not welcoming. It doesn't create belonging for women, for people of color, LGBTQ, people with disabilities. And so one of the things that's really important that I think this group of tech companies is we're saying we're going to work together. We're going to find solutions together, and we're going to truly address the underlying cultural elements that makes it so hard for uh, people like all four of us to feel like we, we belong, that this is our natural home in the tech industry. Well, I hope it doesn't take decades either, and right. I appreciate you taking the time to join us to share your work. Very important work indeed. Una King, Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at SNAP. Bo Young of Uber. Travis Robinson of Spotify. Thank you all for taking the time to join us. Coming up, meet Meta. Facebook changed its name after a live virtual presentation about the metaverse and how they're working on it. We will have the latest. And as we head to break, more from the Apple earnings call. CEO Tim Cook has been talking about how the supply chain crunch has affected business. Take a listen. This is Bloomberg. For this quarter, we think that the primary uh, cause of supply chain uh, related shortages will, will be the chip shortage. Uh, it'll affect, uh, I, uh, it's, uh, it is affecting, I should say, pretty much m most of our products currently. Let's get back to Facebook's name change to Meta and our own Ed Ludlow outside the company's headquarters in Menlo Park, California. The new Meta sign right over his, <laughs> right over his shoulder. And Ed, what's been the reaction to Mark Zuckerberg's big I mean, it, reveal? It's, it took seconds for them to whip off that canvas and reveal the new logo right after Zuckerberg made the announcement. Hundreds of employees have come out to take selfies. But you've got to remember the groundwork for this has been laid over several quarters. We know that they've been ramping up their investment in Facebook Reality Labs, the division that works on augmented and virtual reality. And they made this kind of big announcement in the earnings this week that they will ramp up CapEx to between 29 and $34 billion next year. That's almost doubling CapEx. So they're really putting their money where their mouth is. And what's really interesting is all the reaction on social media to this, right? Some people almost believe it's not real. But Zuckerberg was pretty candid, I felt, about how distant this is from being sort of a mainstream thing. At, at the end of the decade, it could touch a billion people, but we're only talking hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions taking place in the metaverse. Right. But Facebook may get a huge investment, $10 billion. And the big question remains, how is Meta going to build the metaverse? The other big takeaway, right, was the new hardware announcement, this next generation of Oculus. And I, for the first time during that presentation, we all came to understand 
what is actually the metaverse? If I'm a customer, what, how do I experience it? And they kind of outlined, you know, the real interesting healthcare and fitness scenarios. Imagine doing a fitness class, right? But instead of on your Peloton or using another product, you're wearing the Oculus headset, you're seeing the people in the class with you, but they're there virtually. You know, you might be on the East Coast, I might be on the West Coast. We had the same hardware, but we're sharing a common place. And Facebook really, or I should say Meta, is going to take some getting used to, really stressed this broad use case, right, for the hardware and the platform itself. It's not just gaming. It's how we do business, enterprise, uh, e-commerce, interact with each other, do a business meeting so I don't have to fly to New York for one and save the planet, essentially, was Zuckerberg's argument, by cutting the carbon footprint. So they kind of set this out, but were candid. This is a long way away from being real. I spoke to Meta's now, uh, Nicola Mendelssohn, earlier in the show and asked if this is, this is Facebook running away from something. She said, absolutely not. Do we think this is going to change the conversation, Ed? This idea was first reported on October 19th. Investors have had time to digest, and they've been commenting that this does not sweep under the rug the issues around content moderation, the issues around child safety on the various platforms. And this is a change in name only. The corporate structure is the same. The Facebook properties are the same. How the business is run is the same. Reid Hoffman, okay. for example, told you, what does this actually change? We shall see. Ed Ludlow on the ground for us in Menlo Park. Thank you, Ed, for your reporting today. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I want to make sure you tune in tomorrow. We're going to be joined by MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor and Jeff Lawson, CEO of Twilio. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg.